Good morning, everybody. Are you all in your faces with bright, pretty faces? Now I got a got I got several no's on that one. Faces aren't all, pretty, I guess. Revelation ten. I like this. I like what I'm about to share with you. I started this last Sunday morning. By the way, you like my pants? You like my pants? Got these for a buck. Yeah, over at uh, Planet. Set my truck full of khaki. It's on. It's showing on and green and green and on. Check one, two, one, two, one, two. I bet it's this right there. I bet it's that right there. But anyway, uh, it's hit and miss because they don't put the leg size on the pants. They just put the waist size. So... I, I grab, and even that, that the waist size is probably going to be wrong. Yeah, because I got, like the other day, I got four pair of pants. Or no, it's like six pair of pants. And uh, about four of them I had to take back. Or no, I gave them to Michael. Because uh, they, were, they were like uh, four points south of my waist size. I ain't going to tell you my waist size. So even though they said what my waist size is, they didn't fit. So I gave them to somebody a little bit skinnier in the belly. And um, but yeah, that's that's a pretty good deal. I like that kind. Of, and then they had they just they had the blue and the khakis, and they had some corduroy. And that just all corduroy did was remind me of when I went to Twin City Christian Academy. You had to wear corduroy pants. Yeah. Yeah. Do what? Yeah, start a fire with corduroy pants. All right, Revelation chapter 10. Uh, one of my favorite things, the little book, the little book that's open. Now, I've already covered part of this in Sunday school last Sunday, but I'm going to run through it very quickly. Uh, in Revelation 10, he added his hand, a little book open. This, for me, with all the things that we see, that he's a mighty angel, he's clothed with a cloud, Rainbows upon his head, his face as it were the sun, his feet as pillars of fire. All of that tends to point toward Christ. But the fact in verse 2 that he had the little book in his hand open tells me 100%. It, it's like putting the, the whipped cream and the cherry on top of everything. It's like it nails it. Um, because the first time we see this little book or this book uh, is in Revelation 5. God has it in his hand. And uh, when you read various commentaries or listen to various people, they'll have various what they call interpretations of what they think the book is and so on. Well, this is the title deed to the earth or the title deed to this or whatever. Um what this book is, you're holding it in your hand or you have it in your lap right now, is what this book is. This book is dominion and authority. This book rules over our life, does it not, as Christians. This book even signifies what Christ must do when he comes to the earth. Because in uh, Hebrews 10, um, Jesus spake these words. They are also recorded for us in the Psalms. Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. So uh, one of the things that astounded me the first time I read this in the book of Psalms was that God actually exalted his word above his name. In fact, I feel like showing you that verse. 
Not just saying it, but showing it to you. So let me type this in here. Uh, above. I don't know how to finish it. I don't know if it's above thy name or above all thy name. Not they, thy. No, that ain't it. Above all. Yeah, Psalm 138, too. There it is. I will worship toward the whole, thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Now that's something right there. There's actually a commandment that says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. So as important as God's name is that we don't take it in vain... He says that his word is more important than that. Because as I pointed out to you earlier, it's the book that God wrote that has authority, not just over us, but even as I said earlier, Christ must do according to the book. He promised God the Father that that's what he would do. I'll do it according to the book. So... Uh, let's see here. I'll go back to my notes. Meanwhile, back at the ranch. There we go. Uh, we have uh, the book in God's right hand. Verse 3, no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much. I almost knocked that off, didn't I? I wept much because there was no man found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. Uh, so then the, uh, the elders said, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. So you have the book in God's right hand. And then in Revelation 6, you have Jesus opening the book. And then in Revelation 10, you have in this angel's hand, the book opened. Okay, now it's opened. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh huh. Watch this. I'll do a magic trick for. No, I don't do magic. Let's take a look at that phrase. Book of Life. Eight times in the Bible. Philippians. Uh, I, I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, who helped those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. You're holding the book of life, Gary, in two ways. Okay? One way is you've got your hands, your fingers, and your thumbs sticking in various parts of it. Okay, that's one way that you are holding the book of life. I'll show you another way here in a little bit. Revelation 3, he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Revelation 13, 8, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now that's an interesting verse. It says here that if you are truly born again and your name is written in the book of life, don't worry about being, um, about being given the mark of the beast against your will. God's already promised you it won't happen. Won't happen. All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So if your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, do you have to worry about whether or not the breakfast uh, sausage you ate contain genetically modified material or not. Now, you may not like that as a... I don't like it. 
as, a, as just like a, a, a way of life, I don't like it. I don't like the fact that they are genetically modifying the food that we eat, so on and so on. I don't like that at all. But does it, does it take away my salvation? No. Will it cause me to have the mark of the beast? No, 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 no. And one more no. Because I am promised that if my name's in the book of life, it cannot happen. Now, if my name is not in the book of life, I've got bigger things to worry about than genetically modified bread. I need to worry about where my soul is going to spend eternity. Amen. Uh, verse uh, Revelation 17, 8. The beast that thou sowest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Oh, get ready. Get ready for this one. In fact, let me put this one up on the screen. And they that dwell therein and uh, that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not yet is. How can something not be here and be here at the same time? How does that happen? That somebody could not be here. Where's, where's George? Well, George is not here. Really? Because I thought I saw him here. Well, he is here. Where is he? He's not here. See, that doesn't work, does it? JR, get up and go turn the lights on and off at the same time. Not on first and then on. Turn them on and off at the same time. Can you do that? We don't know how that, we don't know how that works. Huh? Quantum physics. Let me explain that. Because I there's some things, there's uh, most of what I, I've heard about quantum physics is right over my head. I have no idea what they're talking about. But I do know this, that we were told when I was going to school that the atom is the smallest particle that there is and that everything was made up of atoms. But we find out later, as I'm growing up, I'm still not there yet, but as I'm growing up, I find out that um, where was I going with that? Oh, talk about qubits, right? Yeah, that atoms are actually made up of smaller things and they call them uh, quantum particles. Whenever you hear of the word quark or you hear of the word, the phrase Higgs boson or anything like that, that is what's called a quantum particle. And a quantum particle actually has the ability to be in what's called a super state. Uh, picture like a, a light switch on or off, but in the quantum world, the light switch can be both on and off at the same time. There is a, what they call a thought experiment, experiment that says it's called Schrodinger's cat. And Schrodinger's cat is in a box, a shoe box with the lid on it. Nobody's seeing what it is. And so we hypothesize that the cat is alive. However, the cat in the shoe box is both alive and dead simultaneously. It's not until you open the box and you look at it when you observe it, that ruins it because now you're seeing the cat is either alive or dead. But if you're not observing it, and this is what I don't understand, it's both at the same time. And what you have, the, I, and I love the language of the King James. I think the King James has absolutely preserved this language for this very reason. It's telling us that the beast is, is not, yet is simultaneously when you hear of quantum computers i wasn't going to talk about this thanks a lot dave when you hear of quantum computers 
in, a, in the computer that you have called your phone. Your phone's a computer. It's what it is. It's a handheld computer. Or your desktop or your tablet or your laptop or whatever kind of computer you're using. The computer in your car runs this way. It operates on a series of electronic switches that are either on or off. And those electronic switches de define um, how the, the brain of the computer reads the programming that you sent to the computer. And it reads whether a switch is on or off. If it's off, it's a zero. If the switch is on, it's a one. That's called binary. And have you heard of people who refer to themselves as... Okay? But with every switch in this building, every switch in your house, the switch is either on or off. There is no super state where the switch is on and off simultaneously. Unless you're in the quantum realm, unless you're in that realm that is so absolutely small, we cannot, we cannot grasp it, how small it is. But the way a quantum computer works is that it sort of dips into an alternate reality, an alternate uh, realm, as it were. And it's a place where the switches on the computer can be both on and off at the same time, which gives the quantum computer an ability that no other computer in the world has. It gives it the ability to not just play out a chess game one move at a time. It plays a chess game all moves all at once. It sees every move all at once. That's a God that can do that. Okay, That's what a God does. A God can see all states and all things all at once. So anyway, that's I wasn't going to get into that, so... I'm going to move on. Um, but yeah, from the book of life, if your name is not written in the book of life, you're going to wander after this beast. He is going to be something that to you, you're going to go, wow, that is amazing. Whereas those who are born again and whose names are written in the book of life, God says to them, don't look at that. That's not amazing. Let me show you amazing. And then we get to see New Jerusalem. Amen? Uh, let's see here. Is that it? No, we got one more. And I saw, yeah, Revelation verse, uh, chapter 20, verse 12. Oh, that's not all of them. Here we go. I saw uh, the dead, small and great, stand before God, and, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. The books were open. Two types of books here. One set of books. And I have an interesting story to tell about that. And I'm going to tell it during the message. I had a pastor call me. Brother John Uter called me this morning. Wants us to pray for him. And I'll tell you why during the message. It's a very, uh, very eye-opening event that happened to him. But anyway, the books spoken of here in Revelation 20, verse 12, are the books of everything wrong that you've ever done. Now, is there a chance that God left some things out? Nah, not a chance. Um, if he did leave some of them out, what you have in the book is still enough to condemn you for eternity. The sins you committed against God require an everlasting payment for it. It means you have to pay eternity for that particular sin or the sins that you committed. So the books were opened uh, of your deeds and the things you did wrong and another book was open which is the book of life this is the lamb's book 
that has everybody who is saved, was saved, is saved, will be saved uh, throughout eternity. Their name is written in this book uh, and so on. Revelation 20 verse 15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And I would just ask you a simple question. Do you know for a fact that your name is written in God's book of life? Do you know that beyond a certainty? You absolutely know it. It is everything that you live, speak, say, do, every action that you commit is because your name is written in the book. Every good deed that you do is because God has written your name in his book of life. Even every time when you make a mistake, when you sin, but when you repent, you repent because your name is written in the book of life and you do what the book calls you to do. Let me explain it to you like this. Let me explain it to you uh, in a way that you might be able to understand. A book called DNA. DNA. Brother George. I love you, brother. And I, just, I say that for a reason. Because I'm fixing to uh, talk about your hair. When you were uh, 15 years old... Were you bald then? Big bushy head of hair, huh? Elvis? I believe that. My dad was Elvis. He had the mutton chops all the way down to here. Oh yeah, he liked them. So what happened? Did you just shave it all off? Keep it shaved off? You grew out of it, right? Your hair stayed at four foot ten. But your body grew to five foot five, right? It grew above you. No, it fell out. Do you know that was written in your DNA? The moment you were conceived, the fact that your hair, most of your hair was going to disappear at a certain age was already written out for you. Now, who wrote that book? God did. God wrote DNA. In fact, there isn't DNA in this world that God hasn't written. If it's alive, it has DNA. And if it has DNA, DNA does not write itself. Okay? Which was sort of my theory in high school. I always felt like the test answers would write themselves. And I didn't have to study. Right, Mom? I didn't have to study, so I wouldn't, okay? Then I got into college and realized that they don't write themselves. I must take notes on this stuff. And what I'm getting to is, in fact, let's go ahead and do this. Let's go ahead and do this. I'm going to show you a book that is absolutely so amazing. You will praise the Lord. Turn to Psalm 139, if you would. Psalm 139. I want you to underline this verse in your Bible. I used this verse um, when I was um, when I was giving a lecture to the students at Purdue University in Lafayette, Indiana. Um, now they came specifically. To hear me, so I think some of them came to make fun of me. That was fine with me. There is no such thing as bad publicity. Um, but anyway, in the article that was written about me in the uh, Purdue University newsletter, newspaper, or whatever, uh, was a very condescending, Mike, sort of like Mike Hoggart is a big fat idiot type article, okay? That's kind of how it was written. It was making me out to be a buffoon, like a like I just make stuff up and this is my, you know, my puny religion and so on. Um, but I there was a young lady on on the Wednesday night service 
that, I mean, I could tell she was sending daggers out of her eyes through me. And she was going to contradict everything I said. And so I decided, you know what, I'm just going to lay it all out there. And if I'm going to make her mad, I'm going to make her mad. And so I got into this in Psalm 139. Uh, who's ever heard of the, the verse that goes, uh, we are fearfully and wonderfully made? Who's ever heard of that one? Okay, that's, that's in Psalm 139. In fact, the verse, uh, four, one, uh, verse uh, 14, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works that my soul and that my soul knoweth right well. Look at verse 15. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Verse 16. Thine eyes did see my substance. Yet being unperfect. So let's say it's 10 weeks after your conception. After you've been conceived in your mother's womb. It's 10 weeks later. Are you a viable um, are you viable enough to be born and they can finish out your lifespan uh, in, um, in a hospital, ICU, or something like that? In other words, can you survive after 10 weeks? No. You have to remain in the womb, all right? And um, so there are... Uh, you are, as of that point, you're unperfect. You have everything written in your DNA of what's going to be, but it hasn't happened yet. So he says, in verse, uh, verse 16 again, In thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance... We're fashioned when as yet there was none of them. So now think about this uh, in relation to the church. So let's say um, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost fell upon all the disciples, was poured out and so on. What happened on that day? How many, how many people were added to the church on that day? What? Do I know? 3,000. 3,000 souls added to the church that day. That means 3,000 people who stood long enough to say, what must we do to be saved? And Peter gave them the simple thing to do. This is what's going to save you. And so 3,000 people, just like that, converted and was added to the membership of, See, we use this term even now. I am and you are, people are, members, not only of the body of Christ, but members of Bethel Church. Now, is Christ done saving people? No. There are still people who are being added to the body of Christ. Christ. So if we were to take this verse and just apply it to that, to me it's a really, really neat verse because it says that our salvation is already written down in the book. It just hasn't happened yet. Now think about that. Um, who was saved when they were older than 20 years old. Okay. Older than 20 years. Who was saved younger than 20 years? Younger than 15 years. Younger than 10 years. Okay. Nine years. Eight years. You two big babies. All right. Seven years. Six. Okay, six. All right, Some, something like that. What well, took you so long to get saved? Why did you wait so many years? Now, let me ask you a question. Did God know that that was going to happen that night? Sure he did, because he wrote your name in the book of life before the foundation of the world. 
He already knows who is and who isn't. Amen. So this book is a book of prophecy in that it has decided already it's everybody's names who is and has been and will be saved has already been written down in the book of life. All that has to do is you got to show up to the time in which God determines that you're going to be saved. And don't worry, you're not going to die before the time comes for you to be written officially down in the book. You're going to make it there if that's God's will for your life. Okay, and I know I'm getting into, uh, oh my goodness, predestination and all that stuff. And I'm not trying to confuse you. But anyway, now think about your physical body. For the first 10 weeks, do you have uh, arms and fingers and hands and do you have um, hair after, after 10 weeks? You don't have any of that stuff. What's the matter with you? Okay, why don't you grow some arms, some legs? Why don't you grow a heart? Your heart can start beating. Actually, by 10 weeks... There is a little bitty muscles in there that's pumping like this. And then after a while, it starts developing into a heart. And here's what this verse is saying. It's a book of prophecy. It's saying like in the church, it's already written who's going to be saved. And I believe that God will draw us as Bible believers or use the messages that we put online or whatever. I believe God will draw uh, a person's mind, their heart, and their attention to maybe a particular church that, that they're supposed to follow or become a member in or whatever. And those people are saved. And then uh, now that they're saved, they have fulfilled what already has been written out for them. They, they've now become a member of the body of Christ. Similar to your body. As your body grew inside your mother's womb, you grew fingers and arms and legs and you used to have a tail and that kind of fell off and it, you grew a big head and you, you grew a heart and all those things and all those things kept forming and kept forming and kept forming all the way until it was time for you to be born now, i'll just ask you a, a very simple question was that baby alive at conception was it its own unique individual? Yes. And I'll tell you why. Uh, when people say, well, that's my body and I have a right to do with my body what I want to do. Okay, you do. You have a right to do to your physical body whatever you want to do. But here's the problem. That, that child in you, that unborn child, and I don't care how old it is, the moment of conception is enough now that child has a completely different set of DNA than the mother does. It is its own unique human being. Nobody else, what, we use DNA now in courtrooms, don't we? Why? Because it is a, a, a nearly 100% way to identify whether someone was at such and such crime scene. In other words, if, um, let's say they had some crime scene, some murder scene there, and uh, somebody said, well, I saw, I saw Chris leaving that house, you know, just shortly after that was done. And Chris says, I was never in that house. I've never been in that house, ever. And the police go in and they find Chris's DNA all over the house. Chris been in that house. It's an absolute. It's an identifier. That's it. You're it. Okay? And that's what I'm getting across. That baby that's inside a woman is not part of the woman's body. It has its own unique uh, set of DNA pairs. DNA double helix. Uh, the 46 chromosomes that DNA is stored up in. It has its own unique genetic identity which to me says the only person 
who has a right over that body is the person who owns the body. Amen? Amen. Let's go to prayer. Father, we ask your blessings on this word. Father, we thank you for uh, opening up our eyes. Help us, Lord, all to, to know the book, to study the book, to want the book to be manifested in us. Father, I believe that the days that are ahead of us are better than the days behind us. I believe that. And Father, I pray, God, that you would uh, bring all of those who are to be yours into the book of life to be ready on that day to see your glory, to see you magnified and honored far above your name on that day. Lord Jesus, magnify your word even above your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.